very much for uh, returning to uh, the presentation or for you new folks. I'll see if I can't give you a little bit of overview of what we have done in our uh, past session. Uh, this actually is the second time we've done this second session. And we did that because we had so much attendance that it actually overwhelmed the system. And we'd like very much to uh, give you the information uh, as we gave it last time. We are going to, for our learning objectives, recap what we talked about in our first webinar. We're going to take a look at clinical benefits and uh, look at the things that, at least eight specific things that we uh, look at for benefits for digital scanning. And uh, ultimately, we will look at 3D printing. Mention it a little bit in this session as well. We will present the range of applications that are afforded by the uh, digital intraoral scanners. So without any further ado, let's talk about scanners. And as you can see on the slide, there are a plethora of intraoral uh, scanners. Uh, we will focus in the upper level middle segment, the itero element. We'll look a lot at that element and its features as we go through the features of intraoral digital scanning. There were when we first started, and we summarized this in detail in our first session, really two types of scanners. A uh, scanner system called triangulation sampling, and another system called parallel confocal. As we have sorted things out, and we talk in our first session, uh, with triangulation sampling, it was the case that we had to use some sort of uh, opaque or, or dusting um, that we would then make a uh, optical field such that we would be able to eliminate things like a large amalgam uh, seen in the tooth. Um, a cumbersome technique, but a technique that was not necessary with other systems. For example, the parallel confocal. So as time has gone on, uh, it looks like the parallel confocal is in fact a, uh, a an optimal system for a highly accurate intraoral digital scan. It does not require uh, dusting or powdering to be able to uh, to view the image. That I think you will see uh, as we go through the presentation is a huge advantage. Let's specifically look at the eight specific benefits. We will ultimately look at 12. We'll divide that into two segments. And in our next session on April 12th, we'll look at those remaining uh, segments, which are, are, are loaded with information. We'll talk more about that at the end of this presentation. I think first, when we look at our benefits, we will look at benefit number one. There is, I think, the main reason that most folks look at digital scanning to be a plus from the patient standpoint no goo, no mess. And from the doctor's standpoint, equally, there is a plethora of problems that we can see with conventional PBS impression taking. Uh, I've highlighted a few, pulls, tears, bubbles, voids, distortion, tray tooth contact, poor tray bond, temperature, technique itself, time sensitivity, chemistry, uh, varying shrinkage, uh, stone model pouring and uh, and dye trimming discrepancies to name a few. I think those of you who are dental students and are in clinical setting can appreciate how cumbersome and unpredictable it is to use the PBS material. And I think you can appreciate how much it would improve your ability to be able to function in a clinical setting to be able to use a digital scanner. Well, the good news is that's true, and it also is the patient experience that is improved with the digital scanner versus the conventional impression taking. Now, because these are very accurate sources of data, there are certain tools that we have embedded in the software that allow us to be able to manipulate uh, these virtual representations that we see on the computer screen. Now, if you look at the screen, you can see, and this is a screenshot taken from the Itero element scanner, you can see that in real time, in the left-hand corner, you see exactly what you see through the scanner in real time, what you see in the mouth. is, And, and then it becomes a uh, a virtual representation, a graphic representation that you see on the computer screen. And if you look closely, you can see the outline of the area that you also in, see in real time in the scanner. Also, uh, we are able to use certain evaluation tools. If you look, there is a tool that allows us to, to look at a opposing arch or the same arch with its target tooth, in this case, the restoration tooth, and we'll follow through with some of the other tools. There is a tool that allows us to be able to evaluate the clearance with a color graphic display. You can see here these different colors have a meaning in terms of 
uh, of amount of clearance and help us to evaluate if we have sufficient clearance for the type of restoration that we may be using. Again, here in the process mode is an Oozle View clearance tool that allows us to evaluate clearance. There is a tool, and if you look closely down here uh, below, in this case, the lower arch, you can see that there is a representation that tells us uh, whether we're going to use a different mode. In the PLAS mode that I showed you was a mode that allows us to be able to see a uh, occlusal gram or a uh, amount of occlusal interference. And you can see in this tool, it allows us to click on a tool that allows us to see whether we do or not want to see the uh, representation as a the representation as what looks like tooth color here gingiva and here tooth color to so have us evaluate a close look at the uh, margin and a lot of folks like to see that as a different color between those uh, tissue and tooth colors we also can use what is called an eraser tool as you can see at the top of the uh, slide we are in process mode, and again, we could choose the upper, we could choose the arch with the target tooth, or in this case, if we have some data that we may feel, for example, saliva or blood or whatever it might be in, in, the, in the field, when we took the initial uh, in data, we might want to move to the eraser tool, erase that area, and easily be able then to take another uh, segment of data and that is automatically stitched back into the full view so that we have the complete data field. Again, these are tools that are available because of the high level of accuracy that we deal with with uh, digital impression taking. To summarize, no mess, highly accurate digital impressions, and we would look at less cost because we don't have shipping, PBS costs, the cost of syringe material, the cost of mixing tips, the cost of trays, for example, all those are costs that are eliminated in the case of a digital impression. It eliminates or can eliminate models so we can work in a 100% digital workflow. And, of course, this allows us to be able to create an STL file that stands for Standard Tessellation Language File and has many different applications. Right now we're talking about a restorative application. There are also applications for our submission, for example, with Invisalign. Uh, we can use the STL file for file merge with uh, Conebeam DICOM data to create a virtual platform to be able to design uh, surgical guides, for example. We can use our STL file for 3D printing. Many, many purposes once we have created this STL file so that we have then moved to a virtual representation on a computer screen, a digital representation, if you will. So we have highly accurate data that we can use for things like a digital scan body, a way that can record the precise position of implants using a rep, using a, a, a scanned and, and designed shape that then can be interpreted by the computer to help us to understand the position of the implant in all dimensions in space and allows us to again work in a 100 percent uh, digital workflow. Accurate digital STL file then offers a wide range of restorative options. Let's look at benefit number two. Accurate milled models. It carefully look at the word milled models. So we can, and where do we get milled models from? Milled models are different than STL, uh, are different than 3D printed models. Milled models mean that we're going to take an object, in this case a polyurethane material, and we're going to take a machine and we're going to mill it so that we create a, a series of dyes with the information we need to be able to create uh, the restoration. This is very similar to what we would do if we poured a model and used uh, individual dyes then to be able to do our wax up on our, uh, on our case. In this case, we're going to use an example, as you can see in the left-hand corner, of uh, milled models that come from Itero. You would order them from the company. And this makes a really good point. It's often the case that you'll have a local lab that you like. You want to keep your workflow, you want to keep the process with your local lab, then this allows the lab to be able to work in the same methodology that he did before, i.e. with dyes, and be able to do those kinds of restorations that you're used to doing. It allows, for example, full coverage crowns to be done, uh, forced and fused to metal restorations on very accurate, wobble-free dyes that can be inserted in and out multiple times and still maintain the accuracy of the dye fit. 
A second feature is that with a milled model, as opposed to a model that is done with the uh, 3D printed technology, there is no cut, there's no cutback uh, of the soft tissue that's necessary. Um, you can see here in this picture, a picture of the dye in the case of Itero on the left, and you can see an SLA or stereolithography 3D printed model and the cutaway that's necessary because we have to create a dye to be able to do the uh, lost wax process and the wax up of those teeth. So, highly accurate models, we can get those from Itero, no dye wobble, uh, no soft tissue cutaway, may use any lab, which is a certain, it's just certainly a good preference if you have a relationship with your local lab, which many of us do. No changes to our conventional lab workflow and highly accurate models that produce highly accurate restorations. Benefit number three, the articulators themselves. And if you look closely, you'll see it, this is a metal articulator. If you look, and I can highlight with my pointer, you can see there is an attachment mechanism, two pins, that fit in place, and there's a set screw to be able to remove those pins that hold this model in place. These articulators are metal with a, uh, a, with, with a high level of accuracy in the articulation, much better and more so than the plastic fittings. You can see they come in different shapes, quadrants, interior trays that allow us to use different positions of, uh, of milled models. Quadrants are very common, anteriors are very common, and you can see also we can use full arch restorations. Here there are special fittings to allow the, the same milled model that comes from Itero to be mounted on semi-fixed articulators, allowing us to do complex cases on the articulators. Um, currently, Whitmix, Hanau, and Dinar have, uh, have special fittings that allow us to use those semi-fixed articulators. This, of course, allows us to use dies in large cases to do more comprehensive dentistry on semi-fixed articulators. So again, to summarize our bullet points, the digital scanning allows clinicians to use highly accurate metal articulators. The milled models are made to snap fit, as I showed you. The metal retention pins offer high stability and easy removal insertion. Uh, the metal hinge eliminates the slop of plastic articulators. The Itero hinge articulator allows many different configurations. I highlighted three, the anterior, quadrant, and full arch. I showed those in pictures. The precise mounting fixture allows standard milled Itero model to be precisely mounted on semi-fixed articulators. I highlighted the Whitmix, Hanau, and Dinar articulators. And the articulators often fle offer flexibility to mount comprehensive cases on semi-fixed articulators, letting us do more comprehensive cases. Benefit number four, a full range of restorative options. This piece, I think, is very important for us to look at. Many of the systems are limited just to certain uh, restorations, mainly restorations that are, uh, that are milled out of a ceramic material. In this case, yes, we can use ceramic materials, but I think it's interesting to discover Itero, because it is a system that allows you to use a physical die, can also do things such as an all-gold crown. Here's an example of an all-gold crown done with a digital scan, an integral digital scan, and a milled model ordered from Itero. And you can see, and of course, there may be indications, second molars are often an example of a full coverage gold crown. Um, here is an example of a ceramic bridge. We'll just highlight some examples of the plethora of different types of restorations. We can do multiple units, in this case a ceramic bridge. It is interesting to note in this view how nicely preserved you can see the uh, soft tissue is in the pontic area, and this is the digital representation using a physical model that's made by the Itero folks. Here is our provisional restoration in place and our final restoration. We can do multiple restorations. Here we're going to crown. First, we're actually going to do the Invisalign to move these teeth into a more optimal position with a simple express case. And once the teeth are in their optimized position, you can see the minimal prep restoration. Our multiple anterior aesthetic restorations here from an occlusal view and here our anterior view. So let's summarize. The full range of restorative options is our bullet point. So not just ceramic restorations, and some systems offer only ceramic restorations, but with the Itero system, we're highlighting 
that is not the case because we can order specific models. Because iTerra offers those milled models, we can do all ceramic, we can do metals such as all gold, porcelain fused to metal, our standby in the past. We can do single crowns, multiple crowns, we can do bridges, long spans, and we can even use porcelain fused to metal. Another benefit of digital scanning, because this highly accurate data can be transferred to the computer in the form of an STL file, we can do modelless restoration, so we can work in a 100% digital workflow. Let's look. Here are two crowns. Here's a crown and a, and a uh, worn tooth next to it. We're going to offer our patient the option to be able to restore these two crowns. I think you will appreciate here the minimal, minimal reduction. We've marked our margins. Now we're going to work in digital world. We've taken our information with our digital scan. Now we're on our computer, we're going to design our crowns, and we're going to have them milled. In this case, they're going to be milled from zirconia. These are zirconia crowns, and if you look closely at these zirconia crowns, you can see we've actually been able to blend. These are not custom stained, because that's not possible with zirconia, but we're able to blend the colors. So here's a B2 blended with a B3 to be able to make a nice uh, gingival margin that then looks very aesthetic. I think you will see those look very aesthetic restoration. Here's a long span zirconia, non-unit bridge, uh, in, a, in this case a failed restoration over time. Uh, this lateral incisor over here on the right hand side, number seven, um, there has decayed and we're going to salvage that tooth with a intentional root canal post in the core. And again, our conservative preparations you can see the amount of bone loss in this gentleman's mouth, making it difficult to even consider, impossible to be able to consider uh, implants. So we're going to do this as a long span bridge to replace, to replace his prior failed long span bridge. We're going to do it in all zirconia. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine unit bridge. And here's the intaglio surface to show that this is in fact a milled solid restoration it's going to be placed in the patient's mouth. There's no occlusal adjustment that was necessary. And this is, in fact, a tight anterior coupled case. Here's our final restoration. You can see the value of digital scanning to work in a 100% workflow. Let's look at two three-unit bridges. Now, we're going to try to kill two birds with one stone. You can see this bridge is fractured. The patient had a fall. You can see a little bruise up here on her lip. And she actually fractured both bridges. But we also had this issue of a black triangle, an unslightly black triangle. And we know from work from Tarnow that if we are within five millimeters of the crest of the ridge of bone to the contact point, there's a 100% probability that we won't have a black triangle. So let's lower the contact point to make that more reasonable, and let's replace these bridges with a restoration that is less likely to fracture. Let's use zirconia. And this is a highly aesthetic case. Again, look at our nice minimal preps. Here are our margins marked. And here are the restorations, but let's look at them really close. Here's a close up and you can see how well adapted zirconia is to these margins. And again, if you look closely, you can see how we have used a blend of zirconia to be able to make a nice restoration. So let's look at our bullet point for modelless restoration. Often, many labs discount the cost if we work in digital world. The Gladwell folks, for example, has a normal fee of $99 for a restoration. But if that restoration is done by way of, the, if, if we are, for example, going to use a Bruxer crown, an all zirconia crown as our restoration, uh, the fee, $99, is reduced by $20 if we send that as a digital scan. So that's a huge savings to doctors. The reason they can do that is because there's no stonework, there's no modeling, and that eliminates costs for them. So a $99 fee reduced by $20 makes an everyday fee of $79 if we work using a digital scan, a lowered cost. The highly accurate restorations eliminate delivery time, and in fact, we can make the case for the return of investment uh, being in the, in, in, the, in the amount of time that we save 
in terms of delivering our restorations. I mentioned before the case of the nine unit all zirconia bridge not needing restora and not needing any adjustment. That is very often the case, especially with our single unit restorations where we have little or no contact uh, 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 equilibration and we have little or no occlusal adjustment necessary for those restorations. With little or no adjustment, that saves us production time, and we think we can usually cut production time about in half. Normally, we would allow a restoration a delivery time of about 30 minutes, cut that in half, is a 15 minute saving. A 15 minute saving times the number of crowns that you'll do in, a, in an average year will be about the cost of a digital scanner. I think the return of investment is very easy to make in terms of actual co actual actual costs that we uh, spent. There's a cost saving in production time, uh, and and we can do restorations now that are, uh, for example, zirconia restorations. And those zirconia restorations, I'm now milling zirconia restorations directly in my office. Um, that allows us to have a a modelist workflow. And that workflow for a zirconia restoration, for example, can be either outsourced or now done in-house. Uh, we'll talk a little more about that as we move through the rest of the presentation. Uh, these restorations can be very aesthetic, as I've shown in the prior uh, pictures, and, and very strong when we use our zirconia restoration, especially aesthetic now that we're able to use these blends of zirconia in the disks that we mill our zirconia out of at least from the lab. We're working on that in the in-house uh, situation uh, for the future. That's, that's still not quite there yet. Uh, let's look a little bit at in-house milling. We talked about it, I mentioned it, but let's look at it a little bit closer. Um, I'm using an iOS TS-150 fast design mill uh, that's paired with information that comes from our intraoral element digital scan. Uh, this is a picture taken from my office. That is the milling unit on the left. And these milling units look pretty much the same. And this particular milling unit is has a, uh, a coolant, a, a, a coolant liquid that is sprayed on the milling during the during the actual milling. And you can see in the distance uh, on the right hand side of the screen, this is a centering oven when we're using lithium silicate or lithium disilicate. Our zirconia is milled directly in this machine. And actually, to be honest, we've come to like the zirconia better than we like the uh, the uh, lithium silicate. And the reason for that is it eliminates this centering step uh, and, and I think makes a much stronger restoration according to the literature. Here's just a close up to show the burr in place milling from the blank that we use. This is a blank of lithium silicate. You can see it looks not like a tooth, but it hasn't been centered yet. Its color will change once it goes into the centering oven. You can see here in this picture. Here's a crown. You can see how nice the margins are. And here is that crown in place in the mouth, just to give you an idea of what the restoration looks like for in-house office milling. Now, we've come a long way with in-office milling in a very short period of time. Uh, in-office milling of zirconia has only been around uh, since late 2015, really for just the last uh, few months. Patients love in-house milling. And again, we talked about reduced costs. Uh, we talked about labs and reduced costs. We talked about time savings as no provisional is necessary. Uh, in the case of in-office milling, we will actually now truly do a crown in an hour, uh, especially crowns that are all zirconia because we don't have to center those crowns. Or we don't have to center those millings. Uh, there's a time savings because there is little or no adjustment that is necessary. We can, in fact, use different milled materials. I mentioned lithium silicate. Uh, that material is called obsidian. Uh, lithium disilicate, that material is known as Emax. And we can mill zirconia. Um, we have now blanks for zirconia. Uh, and, and the high level of aesthetics, I think you can appreciate in what I showed you in slides before. Now, let's look at benefit number seven. And we're going to title this thermoplastic technology on reference models. Uh, if you look at the screen, you will see this is a milled model that came from Itero, and on it there is a retainer. The retainer is made of thermoplastic material. So we can use a milled model, and we're going to talk more about milled models and 3D printed models. In our next session, April 12th, we're going to look at 3D printed models, another way that we can 
use the SDL files that come from our digital scanning. Now to stay on point, we are going to look at thermoplastic technology made on polyurethane milled models. We can, do, we can make retainers, canine to canine retainers, full arch retainers. We can make surgical prosthetic guides, ponic appliances, movement appliance, occlusal guard, athletic mouth guard, bleaching trays, provisional matrix. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples and, and really what your mind can think or what you might want to use are the things that you can use using printed or in the case we'll see on April 12th in the case of 3D printed models. Here let's take a look at what we can make on our milled models. A retainer, canine to canine retainer often used for settling the occlusion following uh, orthodontic treatment. Here is a prosthetic surgical guide with a stent tube to allow us to determine where we might want our final restoration in relation to the placement of the, at least entry position for the placement of the implant. Here are ponic appliance, in this case a thermoplastic with a composite resin tube. Here's a close-up, a nice ovate ponic that can create a nice tissue form. We might have a movement appliance. Here we've made a movement or, or space bubble. Uh, we're going to put a force dimple on the labial of this plastic. Here you can see that force dimple. I'm going to highlight that with the pointer that allows us to be able to push against the tooth with a little interproximal reduction on either side and nudge that tooth back into its correct position. Maybe a relapsed case. Maybe a case that's the only movement that we have. Easy movement appliance. Um, we might use an occlusal guard out of a thickle material, in this case the 080 material. Uh, we might make a athletic mouth guard. We might make a bleaching tray out of the soft type material on a, uh, again, milled model. We might make a temporary out of using a milled model. We might manipulate the model or use the model with the restoration as we've cut. And then we can use the temporary splint material in our matrix to be able to make a, uh, in this case, three-unit bridge uh, provisional. So let's summarize our bullet points. Thermoplastic appliances may be produced on milled iterourethane models. Our STL files can be archived so we can use and make those models again in the future for future use. We can make accurate itero urethane models that are virtually unbreakable. If you are, in fact, it's often the case when I lecture, I'll take an itero urethane model and I'll intentionally drop it. It doesn't break. And you guys <laughs> all know, everybody that's a dental student knows what it's like to deal with a stone model when you're in the midst of making something and you drop it, it's going to break. Or even try to remove the thermoplastic appliance from the model and not have the anterior teeth break. That is not the case with these milled models or is the case with 3D printed models. That certainly is the, that is the way, the direction that dentistry is going to get away from this, the stone ages of, of gypsum products. Uh, urethane models can be reused many times and of course the, co the costs of urethane models really are about the same as the costs of stone models, make it an equal for equal. Benefit number eight, we can, we can use full arch scans with Invisalign and we ought to say a few words about Invisalign. One thing about Invisalign that we need to know is that the process of Invisalign actually uses 3D printing. We'll talk more about that in our next session. That 3D printing process is called stereolithography and a physical model is made and on that physical model, there will be a press down of thermoplastic material, much like what you saw in the last segment. In that case, we then have a, we have an aligner, a clear plastic aligner, a removable, invisible, comfortable series of clear plastic aligners that we can use to move the patient's teeth. We find that the scans that we take, the digital data we produce using an iTero scan, uh, of course, eliminates the unpleasant experience of PBS impressions that creates a better patient and a better doctor experience. There is a quicker turnaround time for us to be able to get to the virtual representation of the tooth movements. We call that ClinCheck. And we find there are better fitting uh, aligners. A couple of slides will make that case. It eliminates the PBS impressions, uh, the time for submission to digital treatment plan about two days, and that has virtually eliminated rejections 
uh, using digital data as opposed to rejections that were very common. Well, uh, they're not common. There were actually about 20% that we would see that were re rejections used, uh, that were when we used conventional PVS impression taking for Invisalign submission. We find fewer fit problems. Uh, here is the patient you can see with the patient reporting to us the better fitting uh, aligners, uh, having had aligners that were created with PVS versus the aligners that were created with digital representation. A digital file, in this case taken with uh, an Itero scanner, looks much like what you see on the screen. And again, the patient will actually report that the aligners feel like they fit better when they have the comparison of having had PVS versus digital scanning. Uh, one of the things that they'll say is it feels like I have less saliva uh, between my teeth, less saliva under the aligner when the aligners are generated from digital data. There are some tools because, again, we have a highly accurate digital source of information, a highly accurate digital file lets us do things using our accurate software, accuracy in, accuracy out. Um, one of the things that we can do, which is a very interesting tool, is we can create a um, outcome simulation of what the patient's start to finish is going to look like. That's a huge tool to be able to use as a communication tool to talk with your patient as you discuss the Invisalign case. Here you can see Invisalign Outcome Simulator. I'm highlighting Invisalign and I'm highlighting Itero because they come from the same country, the company, Align Technology. Align is the company that makes Invisalign, the series of removable, invisible, comfortable aligners to move your teeth, and Align makes Itero the digital scanner that we've highlighted in the first session and you saw at the beginning of this session. Now let's look at what this outcome simulator can do. Here we're going to create some axis lines that tell us the long axis of the T. And you can see in this simulation, this is taken directly from the screen of the sequencing of creating the outcome simulator. In about six seconds from the axis lines, we will create a virtual representation of what the case looks like from the start. And the doctor can take and create a movement of any of the teeth. You can see here are the tools, in this case, an extrusion intrusion tool. And create, you can see the positioning. Now we've added more extrusion to improve the, uh, to improve or at least show the patient that we can improve the anterior uh, incisal edge proportion. And we can do that by way of these tools that allow us to be able to represent in virtual world what we want for the, the, uh, the, for the progress of our case. So those accurate tools, you can see, um, these are some other tools that are used on the restorative side. We have tools that allow us to see the view of different uh, images of our models. Uh, in this case, we'll start from the bottom and work our way up. Here we have a gallery of pictures that allows us to see a buckle, anterior buckle, occlusal, occlusal. Uh, we can put two images side by side. In this case, the side by side images that I chose in the screenshot are here to show you that we also have a highly accurate occlusal rendering that allows us to see uh, how much contact there is between the teeth in maximum intercuspation. Uh, that can be viewed as two side by side images here or it can be imaged as a solid single view. Here's an anterior view. And if you look closely, you can see the color pattern to tell us the uh, relative amount of occlusion. So let's look at our bullet points for our full arch scans. We have a faster turnaround for our virtual representation of ClinCheck. We have a faster delivery time for our aligners. We have better fitting aligners. And we have a scanning viewer tools that include model viewing, Occlusal gram, arch selection, those are things that I've been over to show you features of the uh, Itero scanner. There is a patient education tool called the Outcome Simulator, and there are a plethora of different ortho orthodontic measurement tools. Those measurement tools are archived and accessed uh, by way of the, uh, a, 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 site, a website called Myalign Tech that lets you go and look, and, or, and look at and review the uh, models that look at and review any of the features that you want for orthodontic analysis of the models that you have created by way of the digital file. So let's take a minute to summarize what we've learned today, what we've talked about. We've talked about digital versus 
versus conventional impression taking, and we said the doctor experience and the patient experience are both enhanced and improved using digital versus conventional impression taking. This will be your world in the future. Accurate milled models, uh, accurate milled models allow us to work with our existing lab, allow us to do certain kinds of cases that would be difficult in a 100% digital world. Um, they allow us to use different kinds of articulators, which we looked at. Uh, the bullet point number three of articulators also includes the use of semi-fixed articulators with special fittings to allow us then to do more comprehensive cases. Again, as we outlined, the uh, Dinar, the Whipmix, and the Hanau articulators have fittings to fit these milled models. We can use the full range of restorative solutions, um, for example, anything from ceramic to porcelain fused to metal to all gold. Uh, and multiple restorations, and I showed you even the, in the case of uh, the modelist restorations, long span bridges um, up to really a full arch. I showed you a nine-unit bridge uh, in the case of multiple uh, abutments uh, and, a milled, uh, and, a, and a full arch or, or a nine-unit bridge that was done in all zirconia. We can mill different materials in-house. Uh, the milling unit that I use, the TS-150, the iOS TS-150 uh, instrument, allows us to do zirconia milling, which at one point was thought not possible. So we're not only using lithium silicate, lithium disilicate, and we can use the uh, zirconia uh, blank. There are, of course, many thermoplastic appliances that we can make on milled urethane models. And again, we'll look at using 3D printed models. We'll talk more about that in our next session, a very exciting direction that dentistry is taking to eliminate the uh, relative inaccuracies and the lack of strength of stone by using plastic material in the case of uh, thermoplastic materials, uh, appliances made on either milled urethane or on 3D printed models. Um, we also talked about Itero Invisalign scans, digital scans that allow us to be able to do the uh, Invisalign submission. That it and we made some points that it was a faster, quicker turnaround time, and those are all advantages to our practice in terms of Invisalign. Now, I'd like to answer some questions. Um, I think the best way for this to work, Rich, I finished the presentation portion, is if you can hear me. Yeah, and if you will just give me some questions, I'll uh, do my best to try to answer. Sure. Thanks so much for a great, great discussion for us all. And if you wouldn't mind leading us through your thoughts on several questions that have come in over the course of the dialogue. It will be very, my pleasure. Excellent. The very first of those comes from Carrie, who asks, I understand that digital impressions save money by avoiding shipping, PVS materials, syringes, et cetera. How much would it cost in, to 3D print a model? A 3D print, actually, it's really funny you asked that question. I had that exact question come up today, and we actually uh, called our um, supplier of polymer materials so that we could do a direct comparison of costs. Uh, and we did it in a per gram of the cost of the polymer material. Um, we're currently using, with our 3D printer, a proprietary material called Med 690, which if you've ever seen a 3D printed model, it's actually a tan colored material. And when we do a, a, a when we did a rundown of the costs, if you were to send models to a dental lab to have them poured in stone, you would pay about the same amount of money as what it would cost you to be able to do uh, the printing in a 3D printed material. So, using a, if you use some stones, they're obviously much less expensive than other stones. But a typical die stone poured model is going to cost about the same amount of money as a 3D printed model. That's interesting. Uh, your next question is from Chris, and I appreciate Chris for, for joining with us. He and I have been in touch on several occasions, and thanks, Chris, for joining us this evening. Uh, Chris's question is this, Perry. I know that Itero's patent on milled models is ending next year, which means that other companies are going to be able to offer milled models as well. What do you see as uh, this as far as changing the game in, in this field? I don't think it's a big deal because I think everybody's going to 100% workflow. I have, we looked the other day, just interestingly, in the last year I did one case with a milled model out of all of the cases that we did in our practice. Uh, I, I think 
the 100% digital workflow is where we're headed, and, and I'm making a conscious effort to try to push that envelope to do anything that I possibly can that was once a restorative procedure done on milled models or done on dyes, um, and now is done in virtual world. Excellent. And Perry, you know, this one you've heard on a couple of occasions as well, including, I believe, our first broadcast of this presentation. Can you talk about uh, the necessity of placing cords and the difference between scanning uh, sub-gingivally and super-gingivally with the scanner? Yes, yeah. Uh, you should think about it this way. You have to have a clear line of sight regardless of what impression technique you use. Uh, if you don't, you risk capturing an impression of the material, uh, saliva, blood, or whatever that material might be that's in the way. So if you have a deep subgingival prep that you've done, uh, you're going to have to have a direct line of sight with the digital scanner. So we're going to use retraction cord, and we're going to have to have a bloodless field, all the same principles that we have when we use our conventional PBS material. Um, at, just as an aside, in my practice, we often find that in, in really large cases, we'll often provisionalize the case and not attempt to get the restoration, get the uh, scan in a single visit. We'll have the patient come back with provisionals where we'll test the occlusion. We will provisionalize for the purpose of making really nice margins uh, and tissue adaptation so that we can predict where the final restoration will be relative to how the tissue adapted to that provisional. That's really important because it's nothing worse than putting your final restoration in place only to find that that margin that you thought you would tuck just below the pre-gingival border now is fully exposed because you didn't provisionalize correctly. So I think, I think the principles are exactly the same, that you're going to have to use retraction cord, you're going to have to have a dry field. You're going to have to have a direct line of sight. Uh, and the standard tools that we use, um, I'm a big advocate of things that really work and are inexpensive, one of which is a electrosurge. Um, in fact, I still use the same electrosurge that I had uh, for many moons ago when I first started practice. An inexpensive tool, easily accepted as far as patient uh, toleration. I have never had a complaint about uh, using electrosurge, and, and I'm a big fan of using a very thin tip to be able to electrosurge uh, my margins uh, prior to uh, doing my digital scan. I, I'd use those same principles uh, when I used uh, conventional impression taking with cord. Uh, I, I don't think there's a difference. Um, I, I will say that digital scanning is moving along, and there has been some rumblings that I've read about in, uh, in the dental literature of ways that we might be able to see through liquid. Um, that would be fascinating if we could actually do that. So just, we'll see. We're moving fast in technology. Right now, follow the same principles you followed before, and that's the right thing to do. Perry, another question, and, and this is somewhat, uh, I had a chance to watch some of the students using the scanning process for the first time in New York, and uh, were really amazed to see how quickly they could image the entire arch knowing that the speed is something that they'll have at, at really at the outset of their use of the scanners. Is there a specific area of the mouth that makes sense to, to have your first experience? Um, is it anterior in some of the aesthetic considerations? Is it posterior in some of the access? Where do you, where do you counsel your students on the, the first step? I don't think that it really matters. I, I think it, 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 let me just tell you what we discovered at the Greater New York Dental Meeting. Um, I was there to give a presentation about intro, about the use of zirconia for in-house uh, milling. And so we had the opportunity to, to look and, and, and talk to the Itero folks uh, and, and look at really what was a test to see what sort of scanning speeds we might find from people who had no knowledge about scanning. Um, and what they did was on the floor, uh, folks that walked by, you know, dental assistants, uh, folks who had never scanned before were asked to be able to sit down and scan a type of dot, a full arch upper, a full arch lower. And this was a type of dot that students are used to seeing that has uh, tissue, uh, uh, soft tissue representation. So you had to push the tongue out of the way, push the cheeks out of the way, which gave it a little more uh, uh, real life sort of feel. 
Um, typical scanning times that you find for a good scanner in the case of the old iTero system, well, most of my assistants, myself, my son who practices with me, probably in the neighborhood of about oh, five minutes or less to be able to do the upper arch, the lower arch, and a maximum intercuspation uh, dynamic uh, centric bite. Incredibly, these folks who would walk by and use the new element scanner could scan in less than about two and a half minutes. Upper arch, lower arch, and a centric bite. That's an incredibly fast time. Um, and that's with a high level of accuracy. Uh, I, I think now we're seeing times that we probably are not gonna really reduce by much more. And to be honest, what difference does it make? Uh, if we can have times that equal what we do with conventional impression taking, really, we're there. We've, we've, we've achieved what we want to achieve. So if we have something that's simpler, it's easy to uh, teach folks to use, it's easy to pass that information on to our staff, then, then, and we have a high level of accuracy, I, I think that makes the case for why digital scanning is something that belongs in our practice. And Rich, you're exactly right. It's fascinating to watch folks uh, practice for the first time. No, I don't think it's necessary to have to do an anterior tooth or bicuspid. You should feel just at home, as at home with a molar as an anterior tooth. It's very simple, especially simple if you're doing in-house milling because that only requires, it's usually a single crown and requires much less data than a, than a data field that's sent and outsourced to a lab. Great, great. Thanks for that insight, Perry. And Got another one for you. Um, can you solder on the thermoplastic materials produced in this process? The your th I'm, you know, I'm not positive about the answer to that question. The answer is no with 3D printed models. The answer is maybe. The answer is maybe with urethane, but I don't know the answer. I've never done. I've never done it, so I don't know. Um, you, you may have to, you may, to solder, you may have to use uh, a, a, a something that can resist heat like a, like a stone model, which would be a good indication for stone as opposed to the other materials. Certainly you can't do it on, uh, at least with the current kinds of polymers that we have. That said, that said, I had an interesting conversation today with a folk, uh, with, a, with a guy who just toured the Boeing factory, uh, I guess out in, in Seattle, Washington. And he came back with some uh, really interesting 3D printed models or 3D printed little uh, knickknacks that he had picked up uh, from, from, I guess, gifts from the company. And interestingly, they are printing with metal materials. Think about where that might go as far as what we have and what we might want in dentistry. That would maybe allow us, we might even be able to dodge some of the things that we might do with soldering to be able to do using uh, printed technology. I, I don't know. It's just what you can think and what might be the future. I don't know. The answer to your question is, if you were to apply the kind of heat that you need to solder, you would burn a 3D, you would destroy a 3D printed model. And, and that may be the case with urethane. I'm not positive about that. I've never done it. Uh, probably stone is what we need to use. Uh, there we go. I've got a couple questions, Perry, also that perhaps as we get towards the top of the hour that if you want to think about, and, and they're all kind of in a version of, of thinking about that first practice and your acquisition of technology. And as a young practitioner and you're thinking about your investment, um, how do you think about, you know, when, when a new practitioner asks you about the cost associated with the technology upgrade like this would represent for them? How, I mean, I know you're a huge fan and, and you'd make the move anyways because you're a believer in that future and what's on the horizon. <laughs> but for uh, a new clinician who's thinking about that and balancing those considerations, how should they be thinking about the return and, and the investment on uh, a technology upgrade like this versus conventional approach? You know, if somebody asked me today and said, I want you to take your scanner and turn it back in and return back to the days of stone and I want you to return back to the days of uh, conventional PBS impression taking, I would say, well, I'm going to have to give a really, really, really hard look at retiring. I don't think <laughs> I could, I don't think I could return back to those days again. Now, now what that really means, and you're talking to a very conservative guy, 
I'm not that guy that ran out and bought the laser when the laser came around. I'm that guy that thought carefully about what might be a benefit to my patients and what might really be a return of investment in my office. And, and, and just because I like technology, I'm not that guy that goes out and buys frivolous technology. It has to actually have a benefit in my practice. I truly believe that this is a paradigm shift in the way that we practice dentistry. And I think that digital scanning is one of the most important purchases that you ought to think about. It's not that expensive. Probably the neighborhood of twenty to thirty thousand dollars is about where they're all marked, about where they're all priced. Um, there are certainly going to be some software uh, costs that are associated with maintaining the software and the upgrades that are necessary to stay up with uh, thing with with upgrades that occur. Uh, that's all fine. That's just part of technology. That number, I think, is a doable number. I, I think if we go and have to look and say, well, I've committed to an entire package with a certain company, and I have to buy all the different things that in, in, in office milling and all these different things, those components drive the cost to a high level that I think it might not be a, a, a real honest return of investment for a new practitioner. But a digital scanner, which I think is relatively inexpensive, and fairly priced and can look at a return of investment just in terms of the costs that you save in terms of time and delivering your restorations. It, it, it is not a sales ploy. I have no ax to grind in this. I'll just say I can't deliver restorations as accurately as I can digitally compared to PBS. And it saves me time. Time is money to be able to spend 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes to deliver a restoration as opposed to 30 minutes to adjust the proximal context, the occlusion, and spend the time that often is the case with a conventional made crown on a uh, conventional stone model. Um, I think you'll all agree once you actually have this technology in your hands. This would be one of the top technologies I'd put on my list of things to look at in my general practice. All right, Perry, I'm going to pose just one more for you because I think it's, a, it's an interesting question, but it also gives you a chance to talk about our upcoming discussion uh, in just a couple of weeks. And this is a question that who do you use for the surgical guides, meaning when you have the STL files and you want to incorporate them with the DICOM, um, can you perhaps talk to that just for a few moments and, and perhaps uh, describe how you're going to get into that in our next session? Uh, yeah, I, I, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, I, I think one one thing we need to talk about is it's very important if we're going to be able to create surgical guides that we have a platform that is highly accurate so that in the virtual world we have an accurate replication of the surface morphology of the teeth. If we use just a cone beam for that, if the, just the DICOM information from a cone beam CT, that is relatively coarse information. It's not very accurate. But to make a highly accurate surface morphology rendering, you need to have an STL file. That's created from an intraoral digital scan. So part of who I use and who we find and where we have our surgical guides made have to do with finding a company that can do an accurate file merge between an STL file and a DICOM file to create a virtual planning platform that lets us with high level of accuracy design our surgical guide and then 3D print that guide. Send that guide to the doctor knowing exactly where the implant is going to be so placed so precisely that we can in fact place our restoration at the same time that we place our implants. We now have a portfolio of cases that we've been doing uh, where we place a screw retained multiple unit uh, restoration at the same time the implant is placed um, using our 3D printed surgical guides and virtual planning. And there are lots of planners. Um, the folks I've worked with are uh, the IntuGuide, uh, Materialize, Anatomage, uh, Glidewell, uh, all, there are uh, uh, Blue Sky, there are lots of different folks around who offer these planning services. I think you'll find the prices are going to drop and you're going to find that the software, in fact the software is currently available, relatively inexpensive, where you can do the planning yourself in your own office, you'll have your own 3D printer, you'll print your own surgical guides, 
and you'll be able to create the positions that you want for the accuracy and the and, and the, the fallback of comfort that you'll feel comfortable to be able to uh, place implants using surgical guide technology and placement of pre-made provisionals on those restorations. Um, I wish I had more time to answer that question and talk more about it, uh, Rich. I know we're going to breach that. We're going to talk about that subject in yes, depth. Sir. Yeah, with cases uh, in the uh, next session. And just to whet your appetite, I'll show you a 14-unit roundhouse full arch maxilla on six implants, all done with uh, virtual planning and, and file merge, uh, such that that restoration was placed with, uh, with no necessity for occlusal adjustment, which that is phenomenal. Um, we'll, we'll talk more in the next session. All right, Perry, would you just maybe show what that uh, our yeah, summary sir. will look like there? Yeah, that was a good lead into this last slide. Um, on April 12th, we will continue on. Again, I, I'm trying to give you 12 specific, a dozen specific uh, benefits there are to digital scanning and 3D printing. And we will look at fixture level scanning with dedicated scan bodies. Um, I think that is a that, that technology has been around for a while now, and I want to show you some cases and where we and how we developed that. Um, I got to be the first, one of the first beta testers for that technology many moons ago. Uh, we'll look at the merge of DICOM and STL files to create the 3D planning platform we talked about to make accurate surgical guides and immediate provisionalization uh, of those restoration of those implants. Um, highly accurate plastic modeling, uh, which we'll, we've, I mentioned in the context of the uh, milled models, and of course the 3D printed provisionals, provisionals that are made with FDA approved materials such that we can make our provisionals and place them in the mouth. And I'll show you, we're beginning now to explore more and more of that technology. Uh, it's still a little slow to make a provisional with 3D print, but it is doable. And I'll show you some cases that I've made uh, provisionals uh, directly in the mouth, and you'll see that uh, when we look at that uh, next time. Uh, here is a registration you see at the very bottom of the slide, and again that date, April 12th. And Rich, if you've had anything else to say about that, you can follow up. Um, I certainly enjoyed my evening with uh, these folks, and uh, nothing like more than passing on uh, information to uh, future dentists. I think it's a great profession, and we are looking at a huge paradigm shift in technology, and I think you folks are lucky to be able to be entering that world. Perry, thanks so much for sharing your, your knowledge and your time with us this evening. We really appreciated hearing your insights. Uh, thank you, attendees. We are, we're glad you made some time to, to learn about digital scanning and intraoral scanning, and also a special thanks to our, our sponsors at Align Technology for making all of this possible. Uh, we're going to close tonight with just a quick survey. If you wouldn't mind providing your feedback before you leave the session, we'd really appreciate it and look forward to seeing you at part three of this outstanding continuum on digital scanning with Dr. Perry Jones and the next CDS.